contains thank you, uh, contains seven kingdom parables, and uh, uh, what they are. These are word pictures intend to enlighten us on the nature of the kingdom between Jesus' resurrection and his second coming. Uh, in the first two parables that we looked at the last couple of weeks, uh, the first one enlightens us on the types of people we're going to encounter as we do uh, kingdom work, and the second one informs us of the fact that Satan will try to contaminate the kingdom with evil people disguised as Christians. And so that's where we are. Well, today, these next two parables describe the, uh, the growth of kingdom size and influence. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The first one, uh, his son says, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man planted in his field. Uh, though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of the garden plants that becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Okay. Well, what is the symbolism here? Well, first of all, uh, we know from some of the other explanations, the crown is the world. The seed uh, is the kingdom in this case, and the growth is the spread of the kingdom throughout the world. The birds <coughs> landing and nesting in the tree are the various people and institutions and different things that take uh, shelter and residence there in the tree. Well, Let's talk about how the kingdom will grow. It has small and insignificant beginnings. Okay? You know, too often, especially here in America, where bigger is always better. That's one of the reasons why we had the Bible reading we had, where uh, Zachariah is prophesying and says, Who's despised the day of small things? God delights in the beginning of things. It's small and insignificant bidding. There is steady growth over time. Notice that it isn't anything that you would call spectacular. There's just steady growth. But eventually, eventually, that plant becomes the dominant element in the garden. That's how the kingdom grows. Well, let's talk about the results. Let's talk about the kingdom. Okay, the kingdom comes into force on the day of Pentecost, and there's 120 people in the upper room. Okay, 120 people. Pretty, pretty <laughs> insignificant. Uh, the truth is, we have. Uh, Especially if you just talk about go to a football game, you get 30, 40, 60,000 people there. So 120 people stuck in an upper room uh, praying, pretty insignificant. But that day, when the Holy Spirit came, 3,000 people got saved. In time, the 12, the 12 disciples, were scattered throughout the then known world. <coughs> uh, if you read the lives of the, uh, the disciples from uh, uh, tradition, uh, we don't know, we don't have much from the word other than the Apostle Paul and two of the uh, larger, the, the more uh, influential ones, but some went to uh, east and some went west. And what happened is, is Christianity continued to spread east into Europe and into northern Africa. And we read a lot about that in the travels of the Apostle Paul, Peter, John, and then in that area. However, uh, what isn't always known is that it also spread west through Central Asia and into India. 
Now the reason why, if you take a look at what's going west, where you get the Middle East and, and into Central Asia there, is that in 600 AD uh, was the rise of Islam, and Islam went through that area and by the sword destroyed Christians and whatever. So that today you don't find the, uh, the dominance of Christianity that it was once there. But, but at one point, that whole area was largely Christian. Today, today, as we speak, as we sit here, Christianity is the most widely practiced religion in the world. What is this? 33% of the world practices Christianity. Compared to the next largest one is Islam. Pastor, why do you bring those numbers up? Because if you would listen to the media, and if you would talk about the naysayers and whatever, you get the idea that Islam is just taking over everywhere. But you need to understand that Christianity is more than 10% larger in terms of worldwide of the adherents of Islam. Okay? That surprise you? Um, you can see the other religions there, but it is the largest religion. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? It's like Jesus said, the kingdom starts out insignificantly, and today it's the most practiced religion in the world. <clears throat> Let's talk about another one. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked its way to the What are we talking about? Well, what's the symbolism? Three measures of flour equals the world's people and their institutions. Okay? Uh, the yeast equals the influence of the kingdom as it intermingles with the world. And the influence that comes from this is really disproportionate to its size. How many of you have a bread maker? Yeah. Do you use it? Huh? Yeah. It's always interesting to me is you take, uh, in, in our bread maker, you take four cups of flour and a little bit of this and just uh, about two or three tablespoons of yeast, completely out of proportion to the size of it. And yet, what happens, it influences the whole loaf. Right? Well, let's talk about the results. Let's talk about medicine. How many of you are aware that hospitals were started by the church? Are you aware of that? You see, um, and, and I'm talking a long, long time ago. People were sick. They needed a place to stay. Sometimes they needed that. And so the church began uh, sanitariums and places where people could go. And, and they were nursed and they were taken care of and, and whatever. And so uh, at that point uh, in medicine, the, uh, the church is the one who starts the hospital. It is the church who cares for the sick. It is the kingdom that influences that entire... How many of you said, well, that doctor doesn't have a very good bedside man? <laughs> <laughs> Where did our expectations of bedside manner come from? From Jesus and how we're supposed to be compassionate <laughs> to the sick and the suffering, right? Right. That's the kingdom. It started by the kingdom. Um, the, uh, uh, let's talk about something else. Education system. Education. 
the world throughout most of its history, most people, including the leaders, were illiterate. They couldn't read. They couldn't write. There was only a very few that actually could do that. Furthermore, the knowledge, the, uh, some of us, uh, basic knowledges of science, technology, all of that stuff was bound by people who were filled with superstition. I mean, just think, some, all of us had some myths and have studied the myths in, in high school, both in Goldfinch's mythology and all those things. And, and we've had some, uh, I've even told some stories, you know, here about how the leopard got its spots and, and things like that. That's how people explain things. It's superstitious. Crazy explanations. Well, what happened was that because of the Word of God and the people need to understand the Word of God, we started, the church started elementary education so that everyone could read. And from that education came higher grades, and the next thing we know, we've developed a junior high high school system. And we had to train the priests and the preachers and the people that were there. And so the next thing we know, we have a, a college system that is training the professional people and they are all coming out of the church and the kingdom. And the very foundation of the educational system in our world today, for the most part, has come because of the church. Let me make a connection with last week. Do we now understand why Satan is trying to sow tares? in the education system and have evil people in charge of it and take the God out of it and do those things. Is that difficult to understand? All of a sudden, is this beginning to make some sense here? Huh? Um, so that the entire college system even uh, owes itself to the church. Government. Up until the, uh, the Protestant Reformation, government was by force, by uh, usually one person being a, a despot. In Rome, we had shots at the Roman Republic. In Greece, we had the democratic city-states, but they failed. And what happened is, as the Protestant Reformation grew, there became this idea that God's people did not have to be forced, but they could be free. Why? Well, they were good people. They didn't need to be slapped around. They would do what's right in and of themselves. Now we needed to have some rules, we need to have some boundaries, but the idea of freedom and the idea of property and all those things comes out of the kingdom of God. And if you take a look at the American form of government, you will see that its very foundation is in kingdom ethics and the way the kingdom of God is run. God allows us to be free. God allows us to make choices. God allows us to make even dumb choices. Right? Well, you maybe can't fix stupid, and sometimes God just shakes his head. <laughs> but you're free. It comes out of the kingdom. Science and technology. This one is very dear to my heart, being uh, in my original training, I'm an engineer and a scientist. <clears throat> it was 
out of the Protestant Reformation and the theology, the theology that God has two revelations of himself. One is his word and the other is his world. And those two are necessary to understand God. And so what happened is the theologians uh, began with this fellow by the name of Roger Bacon said, well, we have to do this systematically. And he was the one who codified the scientific method. Okay, here we are, eighth grade general science. Remember this? You have a problem, you make a theory, you test the theory, and then you go back and refine the, 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 what you have, right? Remember that, huh? Sounds simple, and for us, that's the way you do things. But it wasn't always so. Roger Bacon was a Christian, a deep Christian. And out of that, as out of people trying to understand God more, came uh, Louis Pasteur, deep, deep Christian, who discovers bacteria and how it was hurting people <coughs> and developed the process of pasteurization. To us, we don't even think about it. It's so common. Or how about Antoine Lavoisier? Antoine Lavoisier began looking at uh, uh, the air and gases and stuff like that. And he was able to discover that what makes fire burn is an element called oxygen. Or, or how about um, oh, uh, Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton, the father of, uh, of physics and mechanics, and the one who is the first to give a, 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 uh, a scientific explanation and, uh, of, the, of the globe, uh, of, the, uh, of the universe, of the planets, of the uh, gravity, and all that, and put all that together in the basics, the things that started things there. He would be shocked today if he returned and found out that he was known more as a scientist than a theologian. And then there's Blaise Pascal. And of course, we have those of you who went on and did physical chemistry, uh, learned about Pascal's law that things are, uh, that the pressure is directly proportional uh, to temperature and inversely proportional to volume and all that, or PVNRT, you know, all that kind of stuff. Deep, deep Christian. In fact, his most famous writing is called Pensées. He's French, and that means thoughts. And they were thoughts about God and His Word. Science and technology. Out of those foundations, I thought today, <laughs> I, was, I was finishing up my sermon and I picked up my cell phone. You wouldn't have a cell phone today if it wasn't for the kingdom of God. Talk about influencing the whole loaf. <laughs> All of us have one just about. We even give them to our little kids anymore. The influence in science and technology. How about economics? <coughs> we began with economics with a barter system. <laughs> you bake me bread, I'll make you a coat, you know, and we barter. Difficult system to work in because what I may have to barter with you and the value of things was difficult to tell and and then, uh, uh, then we came into the feudal system where a few people owned the land and a lot of people worked on it. We got knights and armor and whatever. It wasn't really fair and whatever. And then during the Protestant Reformation, we began with having this group of people who had skills, blacksmiths, weavers, uh, 
pot makers and whatever. And they began with skilled trades and things began to go and we began to develop a concept called money. Now money had been around for a long time. Coins go back three, four, five thousand years and money to try and make a way of exchange. But it was in the 1750s that Adam Smith wrote the book uh, The Wealth of Nations. And in that he described from scripture, how that, and being a deep Christian, he came from a scriptural perspective, how that the world needed to have a free market system based on honesty and a free exchange. Our very system today comes from the kingdom of God. Every system and institution that you will find our world today has been influenced by Christianity. That's huge. That's what Jesus said it would do. Let's make a few observations and go home. First of all, as I was thinking about this sermon, I thought, you know, it's interesting that these two parables follow the one of the tares in the wheat because um, <coughs> Frankly, I left last week a little bit discouraged. He said, here, it doesn't make any difference. You know, Satan's going to try and contaminate whatever you do. And Jesus comes back with these two, with these two parables that says, yeah, he's going to try, but it ain't going to work. Okay? Second thing. The growth in size and influence is by a natural, peaceful process. <coughs> Now in our world, how is Islam trying to spread its vision? With a sword, right? We see all that. How does, uh, how does communism spread its vision for the world, the vision of peace? A sword. How does socialism spread its vision? Well, if you have to kill off a bunch of people to get the ones that believe in this, you've got to do it. Honest. It was the Russian Revolution. That wasn't the way the kingdom works. No. <laughs> what do you do? Well, you plant a seed and watch it grow. You take some influence and stick it in there and let go. But it's a peaceful process. And one that everyone uh, attends to benefit by. Well, let's apply what we've learned. I have to give you this observation that we are now uh, 2100 years from the start of Christianity. And what uh, happens is, and it has always been, there have been cycles of growth and contraction. It goes and comes and whatever. And so that uh, you will, you will, if you study the history of the kingdom, you'll see times of growth. You will see times of contraction. However, the contraction is always followed by greater growth and an expansion in size and influence beyond what it was before the contraction started. So that, uh, we can do that. Now you're just going to have to take my word for it. If you want me to prove it to you, I've got the I've got the stats and everything uh, in my study. We'll do that. But uh, but that's where we are. Furthermore, our current situation, where we are in the world today, uh, to my knowledge, from what I've been able to study about kingdom history and whatever, is really unprecedented. Here in the West, West uh, in Europe and North America, where Christianity has had its strongest uh, base for, uh, oh wow, uh, ever since probably f since 500, maybe 1500 years or whatever in that area. We are in contraction and we are going down. We talk about the American church, how it's in decline. And, and in Europe, uh, they've most of those churches and stuff are closed. You go to Holland, which is just an absolute hub during the Reformation, today is utterly uh, 
uh, almost entirely secular and um, uh, unbelievably uh, hedonistic. Uh, and so in the West, it's contracted. However, in Asia, Africa, and South America, it is absolutely exploding. And there's a huge revival going on in all of those areas to the point that I don't know if it's happened yet, but it was supposed to happen in the uh, 2015 to 2025 range that the center of gravity of Christianity is going to shift south of the equator for the first time in the history of, of Christianity. It's just growing like that. So this is, like I say, this is kind of unprecedented, but it's going to be interesting to see how it works out. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this kind of contraction discouraging. I don't like it, but it is where it is. It is what it is. However, we should expect that this time of contraction will be followed by a time of growth. It's a cycle. Will some of the things stay? No. Right. Will, will it be like it was back when? Probably not. What usually happens is because of the contraction, things change, things shift, and the kingdom gets a new vision and new power and new strength and goes on. So uh, we should expect, it may not happen in our lifetime, but we should expect that uh, unless the Lord comes, uh, this period of contraction will be followed by a time of explosive growth. I hope that gives you hope. Let me close. <clears throat> we are not a large church. We do not live in a very populous area. People ask me, Pastor John, where do you pastor? I say, I pastor a mega church of 50 people <laughs> in the megapolis of Oakley, population 299. <laughs> but I read in my Bible that God doesn't, God loves small beginnings. And we have small beginnings. And while we may not be a large church, and I'm not sure in some respects that we ever want to become a 5,000 member mega church. There are some things that we've got here that you can't do in a 5,000 member mega church. But what we should do as a church is expect to grow in size and influence. That's what let us pray Heavenly Father I've done my best to share what these things mean Jesus thank you for telling us thank you for giving us a history that we can even look at we ask now that you would be with us and that you would dismiss us that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand. Um, take your red hand off, you would. Turn to hand number 323. I, uh, I went through two hymnals, and I couldn't find a good song to conclude this with. And so I thought, why don't we just thank God be with you till we meet again, okay? If you need to pray, we all deserve it.
Sylvia, will you dismiss this Judith? Precious Uncle Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for your presence in our lives. And please help us to share that with other people. Let us share our wisdom and our knowledge, our love. Let us just go on into this community and see if we can touch someone. Lord, so please be with us as we leave. May the God who planted this mustard seed in your heart, may it continue to grow. And may the Holy Spirit, who perhaps started small in your life, may He fill your thoughts, your minds, and your very being. And may you go this way and be the kingdom and watch it grow and watch your influence increase.